It was in 1969 that Seiko introduced the world's first battery-powered watch, and for a time it looked like quartz watches were going to take over the world. Over the next 20 years, sales of mechanical watches, that's watches driven by non-electronic means, plummeted, and the traditional watchmaking industry reeled. Now, however, mechanical watches, particularly expensive ones, are very much back in vogue, but their popularity is creating a problem, and one that's going to take years to solve. In this modern age, surrounded as we are by a never-ending stream of gadgetry, it's never been easier to tell the time. Well, I've got a mobile phone, that's got a clock. That's also got a clock. iPod, it's got a clock on it. Camera, that's even got a clock on it. And even the iPod dock's got a clock on it. Who needs a watch? Well, exactly. And in places like Japan, where they love a good gadget, research by Seiko reveals that wristwatch sales to those under 50 years old has dropped by a quarter in the last 10 years. It's certainly true that they don't need a wristwatch. Um, wristwatches are far, far more uh, voluntary purchases that you know are bought on grounds of uh, of, of taste. But the less we actually need watches, the better business is getting at the top end of the watch market, the mechanical end. People have now got over the uh, the fact of of having uh, quartz watches. They want something that ticks. The majority of mechanical watches come from Switzerland and over the past five years mechanical watch exports there have risen by 50% while battery powered sales have actually fallen by 10%. Overall exports were worth $12.4 billion last year in an industry that's raised itself from the dead. Um, you go back to the early 80s when the sort of after the quartz revolution had happened um, the industry there was literally decimated. One, you know, one company in ten survived. Connoisseurs can now peruse specialist magazines filled with the mechanical watches that make up around 15% of Switzerland's watch exports, but two-thirds of that market's value. Yet as sales grow, so does one major problem. A chronic shortage of qualified watchmakers to service and repair them. Because of the boom of the electronic watch, basically a lot of the industry thought, well that's it, it's game over. And, and therefore a lot of people that were in the trade dropped out of the trade. And we were probably short worldwide by around about two, two and a half thousand watchmakers at this moment in time. Which is why these 12 young men are beavering away in Manchester, enrolled at one of 14 new schools worldwide, funded by nine leading watch brands. Over a two-year course, they'll learn the intricacies of working on timepieces that can have around 300 parts and find out whether they've got the crucial qualities demanded by the profession. Patience, patience, definitely. You need to be, you know, uh, patient to do the job. Well, if you're thinking of enrolling in watchmaking school, this will give you a little indication of the sort of patience required because to transform this spring here into this fairly similar-looking spring here, will take the students at the school about 11 weeks. Now myself, I'd probably do a bit of watchmaking just for the novelty of sitting at a desk worth $60,000. But really, what exactly is the attraction? It's a challenge. Everything's very tiny. You need to learn the techniques to work at very small tolerances. You can look at something and say, I've made that. That's, that's a good feeling, feeling of satisfaction. I wouldn't call it sexy, no. It's a job. How many jobs are sexy? Not too many, I don't reckon. <laughs> sexy or not, are these fellows competent enough to accurately assess the quality of my own personal wristwatch? Good watch? No. <laughs> so he seems eminently qualified, and it's hoped that gradually these chaps will start making inroads into the growing servicing delays watch owners face. At peak times, it can go as high as, as 12, 14 weeks, um, and that's really increased over, over the last four or five years. But even with these delays, and despite so-called credit crunches and concerns about the global economy, this October, Swiss watchmakers experienced record exports, up 12% on last year. It doesn't just display your wealth, but it displays your taste. And the great thing about it is it actually re requires an audience to understand that. So the demand keeps rising. Meanwhile, the school's already booked up for the next three years, but whether, along with its 13 fellow academies, it'll eventually solve the worldwide watchmaker shortage, well, only time will tell.
Switzerland is the leading exporter of wristwatches, exporting about double its nearest rival, Hong Kong. Over 40% of Switzerland's exports go to Asia, about a third to Europe and a fifth to the USA.